Absolutely. Okay, uh, wow, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the optics review for Physics 123. Uh, we're going to get started off with geometrical optics, and we got a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of side issues, and hopefully we'll get our heads and hands around this as best we can. Um, let's start off with just simple reflection. Uh, the idea of something like diffuse reflection is, is a big reason why we can see something. The idea is you shine light on something. It bounces off and comes off generally. It's scattered in all angles. And so that allows us to see things. You know, these various rays will enter our eyes and allow us to see things. Most of the reflection we're going to be dealing with is going to be specular reflection or mirror-like reflection. Uh, um, either a mirror like a metallic surface or something. <clears throat> and this most people are pretty comfortable with. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So the idea that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. We measure those angles relative to the normal. Uh, while it's true these angles are the same, uh, mathematically it's going to be nicer when you move into three-dimensional space like a plane and having a normal that's perpendicular to it. The math works out a lot better. So we'll stick to this convention. <clears throat> we can play all kinds of games. You can do something like with a corner cube uh, that you send a light in and you can play with the angles and the geometry. It's always going to come back in the same direction. This is kind of a 2D. We can extend this into 3D. So typical reflectors uh, will take the light and send it back in the direction they're, they're headed. So like uh, if you're on a bike and a car headlights hit you, the uh, light comes back to the driver of the car. And that's, so that's kind of a corner cube reflection. Uh, now, if we have something like a mirror, which you should be, have experienced by now, and, you know, you, you uh, stand in front of the mirror, you see you know, this beautiful person behind the mirror that is the same distance behind as in front. Of course, the idea is, well, there's nothing really back there, right? You, you've got to figure that out by now. Uh, but the idea that the light coming off of it, maybe we light this thing up with specular ref reflection, the light, the light bounces off the object and off of each piece of the object that you're going to send out uh, and uh, are going to reflect off. And the idea that each of these rays, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, and they go flying off in a direction that we can extrapolate back the, these reflected rays back to a point here. And this is what we'll call a virtual image. So you stand in front of the mirror, you do see uh, you behind the mirror. It just appears that way. These dotted lines represent virtual rays. Uh, they're good for construction. The actual rays are all on this side. And if they come off of here and into your eye, the lens of your eye can form an image of them. So uh, uh, without that, there is no image of the person that's on the other side of the mirror. Uh, we'll look at things like curved surfaces, like a concave mirror. <coughs> and uh, uh, of course, that's caved, kind of caved in like this. There's also going to be a convex mirror. For a concave mirror, we get light coming in. Now, I've got uh, kind of arrows pointing in both directions. I want to make the argument the light can travel either direction, so it's kind of nice to have that point of view. But if we start off with just parallel rays, this would be like sun rays coming in on this thing. They are going to angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. They're going to pass through a point. And uh, they will, for a spherical surface, which are the only ones we're going to be dealing with, they do a pretty good job, but really only formally at narrow angles. Um, at something as big as this, they really actually are going to miss a little bit here. And there's, so they're going to be, they're not going to pass perfectly through a point. Uh, if you want to get that to happen, you use a parabolic surface. And then, then there's a focus that will actually bring these to to a sharp focus. But we will deal again only with a concave spherical mirror. It's got some kind of radius of curvature to it. It's got some center to it. And if we look at one of those rays that's coming in parallel, it's going to uh, bounce off the surface. We know the normal of the surface would be lined up with the center of the cir circle. So it's going to come in angle of incidence equals the angle of the reflection and it's going to go off. 
uh, for a small angle, this angle and this angle, because these rays are parallel, cut, cut with a transversal. If you remember your geometry, I know a lot of people are kind of weak with that, uh, that this angle is equal to that angle, so all of these are equal. If I've got two angles here, th this is an isosceles triangle, this is equal to that, and so for small angles, this swings down and is approximately the focal length. So this argument that this is equal to that means that the focal length is half the radius of that, of that circle. Again, emphasize small angles. So this, uh, what we're going to use here, this point where they all seem to come together is what we're going to call the focal point. The uh, distance from the surface to that point is going to be the focal length of that lens. Okay, so uh, if we take a convex mirror, uh, coming back this other way, we bring in parallel rays. They're going to reflect off angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. They're going to go off that way. And similar to the uh, plane mirror that we used in the last slide, that these projected lines, I've got them as dotted lines, these are virtual rays. And they c seem to emanate, reflecting off of here, as though they're coming through the focal point. Uh, or call, through this point, which we call the focal point of this uh, uh, mirror. Uh, we're going to see when we get into uh, doing some problems, we're going to end up calling this uh, a negative uh, radius here. Uh, but we'll, uh, let me hold off and get into the signs in a bit. I can do something similar to this. The idea that uh, we would have a parallel ray coming in, it's going to reflect off and it's going to angle of incidence equals angle of reflection and those two angles are back here they're going to be equal similar argument this is equal to that and so the focal length of this thing is just one half the radius um, okay now we can use concave mirrors to form real images uh, we won't be able to do it with convex mirrors for a concave mirror, let's just kind of play with this. The idea that we can place an object here, we can form an image over here, and this is going to be what we'll call a real image. A real image is not where it just appears to come from, but there's actually rays that are going to pass through this point. And if I place a screen there or a piece of paper, that they're going to converge and they're going to light up, light up that point. Now, there's a coming from the object, we've got. Uh, I'm, I'm just taking the rays that are coming off the very tip of this arrowhead. There's actually an infinite number of them that are coming off. We're interested in simply the basic construction rays, or trying to visualize it that way. And one, one ray that would be coming in parallel would come in and off the, the mirror. I've, you notice it's kind of hitting the, off to the side here. Keep in mind that uh, we really are dealing with small angles so that these approach this. Um, if you're doing an actual uh, diagram like this, you can turn it into good numbers as long as you say, okay, it's going to strike and strike this surface. So the idea of, again, the parallel ray is going to come out. It should pass through the focal point and would then go on. Uh, there's also going to be one, uh, the rays can go just as well if, there, if there's a ray that's passing through the focal point here. Uh, it's going to come in and it's going to go out parallel. Uh, that's going to do that. And then there's also one that is, that is coming down and is going to hit this point. Here the mirror is flattened and so angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. It's going to go off and it, should, it too should go through this point. So there's a bunch of them. We, to, to determine where the uh, images, we really only need two of them. But uh, it's good to see that all of these happen to line up. There's another one here that would happen to come right through the center here. And that's going to strike this thing at 90 degrees and go right back in this direction. So again, you don't need all of these rays, but uh, these are our, our typical construction rays. Now, we can use this to develop some geometry and, and algebra. And we're not going to take the time to do this. Um, uh, we can use this, and I think you've been using this, hopefully you've been exposed to this, uh, is going to be the, the mirror equation, very similar to the lens equation, so we've kind of got this, the same. 
uh, where the object distance is measured from from this surface out to where the object is. This is we're going to call P for that that distance. That's the P. Uh, the Q is the image, and the Q is going to be measured from here out to where the image is. That's Q. Uh, the focal length again is just going to be uh, R over two, or when we stick it in here, it's going to be two over R. This will govern what's going to happen here. So we don't need to necessarily draw accurate diagrams, but they do help to kind of picture what's going on. Now, there's various sign conventions that, that we get playing with, and this always is kind of a pain. The book presents you with kind of a table of sign conventions. Um, I am primarily visual, I see things, and I want to give you kind of a visual way of remembering your sign conventions. One is this picture here is, uh, notice that uh, everything is on this side of the mirrored surface. Here in this, as far as doing math problems, we'll have P, Q, F, and R are all considered positive. So uh, we will form a real image uh, if we have that is with light traveling in this direction, uh, we'd be coming from the object, and uh, the, the object distance P is going to be positive. Uh, we will form an, a real inverted image here, and that's going to be Q. Q will be, be positive. If we happen to go through this uh, in the problem here and we come up with a negative Q, that just means that it's over on the other side. There's also a strange beast we'll come to, to as a, a, a virtual object. And if that object, instead of being back here, happens to be on this side, that's negative. Anytime that changes. Uh, the radius of curvature, if the center is on this side, is positive. Virtually everything is positive here, except for one exception. Uh, we will say that this object, the image, is inverted. So that's going to be a, a negative magnification. But that, that's the only thing. So if you can kind of get this basic picture in your mind, you don't need to use all these rays. But again, if the object's here, uh, the image, if it's a real image, is going to be back here again. It's going to be inverted. And, uh, and uh, everything, again, is, is positive. If we happen to go with a a diverging mirror or a convex mirror, there the center of curvature would, would be back on this side, then that goes in as a negative number. So again, a picture here is where everything's positive, or almost, with the exception of an inverted image, and any time anything crosses back to this side, it goes in as a negative. Now, we also have something here what's called magnification. Uh, we have the object here, I got it height h, and uh, looking principally at this ray, you can see it's going to come down, it's going to hit this flat part of the mirror, it's going to angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. These two angles are the same. Now if you look at these kind of green shaded triangles, they are similar triangles so that there should be some proportionality. Um, we're going to call the magnification, which I think this is the most uh, intuitive, the magnification is how big is your image compared to the size of the, your object, h prime over h. Uh, we're going to use for h prime, we'll write it this way, but if it's inverted, we'll call that a negative number. Now we can look at uh, these basic ratios, we can say h is to p as h prime is to q, and so I can turn these, this ratio of heights into something that is more useful for, uh, for, uh, for doing problems is going to be Q over P. Q is to H prime as P is to H. Uh, we do doctor the equation a little bit since both P and Q would be positive here. We get an inverted image. We're going to stick a negative sign in there to make our sign convention work. So this is kind of a doctored, doctored feature. Uh, here, if we're doing it in terms of H prime, we leave it in like this, but with the understanding H prime could be uh, negative. This is what, of course, what we're calling the magnification. So again, uh, generally we have light traveling this way. We call this thing the front side, this side the back side. 
You want to be careful that in some problems, uh, like in your homework, where you get light going through a lens, maybe going through bouncing off another mirror, maybe it's coming back this way. Uh, you want to consider what is the direction of the light. This sign convention is based on the direction going this way. <coughs> if we need to reverse it, flip it back, then uh, we go the other direction. Okay, uh, let's, let's do a little more here. <coughs> Uh, here's uh, it's kind of a confusing diagram. I almost pulled this out But if we just kind of look at a concave mirror and we play with different things where I'm going to take the object And I'm going to move it in closer and closer and closer and closer to this concave mirror and uh, See what happens to the image so this first one is this first image and uh, One thing we can do with all of these they are the way I'm arranging them They all have their tips of the arrow heads all along this parallel line And we so know that all the rays coming from those would go off on this uh, right through the focal point and would form a line then as far as the heights of the images or where they are we can look at uh, the light that's coming in it's going to bounce off this thing angle of incidence equals angle of reflection and it's going to tell us where the image is so if i put my object here i'm going to get an image here if i bring it in a little closer it's coming in at a greater angle so now i've got a little larger image it's moving back as i'm moving forward uh, something's interesting here when it comes right to the uh, center of curvature the uh, image ends up being the same magnitude only inverted uh, as the object is if I get inside of that uh, I can project here get another image here these are getting larger and larger as I'm coming in and in fact if I bring it all the way into the focal point these rays these rays are going to end up going off parallel and they will never converge or we could say they converge at infinity out there where you would have and have your image now you can form a real image anywhere in here if I happen to bring the object inside the focal length let's say at number six here uh, then this is uh, going to be a ray that's going to diverge from this principal ray and it will appear to come from a point back here so these are what we would again call virtual rays they indicate this coming here and uh, back here is what we'll call a virtual image that is they appear to be coming from here um, okay so I uh, hope that uh, helps a little bit now a, a convex mirror uh, where we're going to have the center of curvature on the far side so this is going to go in for the focal length will be negative R goes in as a negative of its back here and uh, you know, here I've got an object uh, it's coming in it's going to go off uh, the ray is going to travel away from the focal point and uh, it's uh, it's uh, not going to form a real image but it will form an image back here this ray that's coming off here if I'm looking at this with my eye it's going to look to me like it's coming from this point and so this is again what we'll call a virtual image there's no uh, there's nothing be actually behind this mirror um, this idea of a virtual image the idea is these are apparent rays that come from here nothing actually is there if I place a screen there I don't get any I don't get a real image these are just extrapolated virtual images if I come in closer what's going to happen it's going to move in a little closer but in, in the case of a convex mirror we always have just virtual images we won't form a real image uh, that's somewhat like uh, the plane mirror that I used in that very first slide where you know uh, the image and object distance are the same uh, for a plane mirror is going to be flat the radius of curvature would approach infinity and this would be zero so we under understand that uh, Q is equal to just to minus P it's going to be on the other side and a virtual image so hopefully this is, is uh, clear I'm going to do some more with lenses
and we can contrast back and forth with those but before we get into lenses lenses only work because of refraction the refraction of light so let's just look at some of the basic ideas with this if we uh, if we bring in light and let's say I shoot a, shoot a laser beam and I straight down into some kind of medium it could be glass it could be water it uh, tends to just go straight on through no bending of that or no refraction or at least not in terms of direction um, and we we've learned in the first section of of this course we played with this idea that frequency times wavelength is equal to the speed of the wave if this happens to be a vacuum the speed of the wave is C the speed of light uh, we've got that when it hits the medium it can slow down and we'll have the uh, frequency times now the wavelength in the medium should be the speed of the wave or the velocity in the medium now an important idea behind this is that as these waves come in think of like uh, crests uh, coming in from the ocean uh, they're going to be coming in and they're going to be striking the shore with a particular frequency and whatever frequency they start when one wave hits here it creates another wave here it starts to move off and will create the next wave and as soon as the next crest hits so one thing that will be true between these two even though the wavelengths are different the velocities are different the frequency is going to be the same whatever frequency this one had we're going to create waves with the same frequency there so if I take these two ideas and uh, I take this expression divide by this expression the frequencies can cancel and uh, this ratio of C to the velocity in the medium is our formal definition of what we mean by N the index of refraction of that medium uh, so that uh, we can uh, look at the uh, wavelength will be equal to the wavelength I've got lambda naught which is the wavelength in free space divided by the index of refraction uh, the velocity of the medium is always less than the speed of light so the index of refraction is always one or greater never less than one and the fastest that the wave travels is going to be in a vacuum okay now if we start to uh, bring the light in at an angle you're going to hit it it's now can bend the idea that these waves are going to come here and when they strike this uh, surface they start to go off at a slower speed and this uh, this idea will lead to kind of a bending effect or the refraction of, of this we look at the overall pattern as it comes in uh, having some angle of incidence measured from the normal and also some refracted angle call that theta 2 uh, with respect to the normal and to kind of see what's going on with this in terms of the wave nature of light when we're coming in uh, this distance here in free space is or, or it could be free space it actually could be any medium uh, I'm having it uh, uh, some index refraction which I'm just calling n and then this one is going to be n2 which is uh, uh, going to be greater than the other so there's going to be a bending in uh, it could be going back the other way where it bends away look at that in a bit um, the now you can look at this these wavelengths here lambda 1 of this medium and lambda 2 of this medium they can be related you can look at these little uh, um, rect I mean triangles that I have here they share the same they say share the same hypotenuse and so that h times the sine of theta 1 is equal to lambda 1 and h times the sine of theta 2 is equal to lambda 2 so we've got these two relationships as well as the uh, velocity to the frequency relating to the wavelength and then take and divide these two things out uh, the h was just kind of arbitrary in here and uh, the frequencies go out and we're left with the ratios of the speed to the index of refraction uh, the C's go out and we can quickly generate Snell's law okay whether you follow this or not you definitely need to know this 
relationship. So N1 is the index of refraction of the first medium, the sine theta initial, that would be its incident angle, and theta N sine theta 2, that refracted angle. Okay. Now, just kind of an overall pattern that I think is helpful to keep in mind. Um, let's say I'm going to shoot light down. Uh, first, I'm coming in towards this thing. If you're coming straight down, you just go straight on through. As you come off at an angle, there is a tendency if we're going from a higher, I mean, a lower index to a higher index. In this case, I've got a vacuum up here. So uh, when it comes in along two, it bends in a little bit. And each of these are going to kind of follow this pattern. One, two, three, four, five. Let's, let's get up to, let's say, six is a little more apparent, where it's coming in at an angle, and then it's going to get bent down in this direction. So it bends, we say, towards the normal. If I come in at seven, uh, here I've got it right along that surface, really if it's just an epsilon above that surface, it can come in, and it's going to come in along here, uh, right at the greatest point, and this is, uh, going to be something we're going to call the, the critical angle. You'll notice that for light coming in from the outside, there's nothing that gets out into this region here. If I want to send light back the other direction, I want to go from a higher index to a lower index, I could run the light and uh, number one, I'd send it straight on through the surface. That's just going to follow this same path. In fact, each of these will end up just going back in the same direction they had when they're coming in. Again, that's why I'm using kind of a double-headed arrow. This works in either direction. But now what's interesting is once we get all these uh, rays in here are going to go out, this seventh ray going out here is going to want to go down the surface. So its refracted angle is 90 degrees. What happens there at that point is uh, really this light at this what we call the critical angle, critical angle, is going to come in and that is rather than go down the surface it actually reflects angle of incidence equals angle of reflection and it, uh, it reflects and that has something we call total internal reflection. Nothing gets out the other side. That would be true for anything coming in this direction as well. Uh, it's coming in, it's at greater than the critical angle, it will not refract, you won't be able to see it if you're on this side. It comes in, it reflects down, and uh, angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So that again is true for all of these. They are just going to undergo total internal reflection. So hopefully you have this pattern down a bit. Uh, this idea that right at the critical angle the refracted ray wants to go off at 90 degrees can help us find the critical angle. If I use uh, N1 sine of that critical angle is equal to N2 and then sine of 90 degrees, which is 1, you can quickly come up with what the critical angle should be. It's the inverse sine of 1 over 1, well in this case it's 1.5 because I'm using glass and using the sine of 90 degrees. So that would be the critical angle for glass. It's kind of cool that it's less than 45 degrees, so this is really good for optics. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the critic, oh, uh, it is really just out to this point. All, all of these are, are angles we will deal with. The critical angle happens for the ray that would refract off at 90 degrees. And then that becomes the critical angle. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so hopefully you've got this pretty well in mind. Now when using various problems, okay, we've got a few that we should look at. A lot of people are rusty with their geometry. Uh, a lot we do with, with prisms, and I thought we'd kind of take a look at this. It's a good representative example of what he might give you. Uh, he might give you a prism problem or something closely related. I'll take a look at that. The idea of a, a prism, we've got uh, two surfaces and an apex angle. I've got this uh, could be any kind of shape. So if we have a couple of uh, facets or faces of this glass 
and we know the angle between them, that's going to be called this apex angle, uh, the, the capital phi, and uh, we can uh, look at how light will traverse this system. Uh, let's say I come in with just some, uh, let's say a laser beam at, at angle theta 1, it's going to come in and strike the normal here, it's going to refract and so this first one, if we're going from, let's say, uh, air or a vacuum into glass, uh, the index of refraction is just 1. Uh, we have the sine of theta 1 equals the n times the sine of theta 2. So that is just talking about this refraction that's taking place here. Uh, now when it comes through, it could go off in a number of different directions. It could go up, it could go down. There's some problems where it goes straight across or it's symmetric. Uh, that simplifies things and rather than get too simple, let's just do the general case. Uh, I just have it happen to have a drawing going up here. Uh, there's going to be another refraction that takes place over here. It's going to depend what this angle is, theta 3. And uh, then we're going to have, a, it's from going from the glass out into the air, n times the sine of theta 3 would be equal then to the sine of theta 4. So the basic idea, if you could come in at some known angle, you should be able to get the refraction, get this other angle, and then if you can get this angle, then you could get the final angle that it goes off. Okay. Now, what's usually troublesome for students is they get this first one and they, in order to do this next part, they need to know theta 3 before they can solve for theta 4. So, uh, looking at this, I've got theta 2 and theta 3. There's lots of ways of doing the geometry, but this is kind of the simplest, I think, most intuitive way of seeing this. And this helps in a lot of problems when you're trying to cut through the geometry of what's going on. When we do everything with respect to the normal, so if we have the surface like this and the normal is at right angles, and imagine I take this and uh, they, so that surface is normal there. Over on this one, the surface is this and the normal is off in this direction. If I take this and I swing this through this ang apex angle, the angle here, the normals have to swing through the same angle. So if you can see that, that can be helpful. So I've got one normal and intersecting with the other normal, the angle between the two normals is the same as the apex angle. That's that phi. Now maybe the geometry is a little more clear to you. Uh, the idea that theta 2 and theta 3 uh, plus this little angle have to equal 180 degrees as well as this little angle plus this angle have to be 180. It's not difficult to show that these two angles have to add up to the apex angle. And this is a key bridge across the prism that uh, we can say, wow, I need theta 3 uh, so I can get theta 4, uh, but if I go theta 1, solve for theta 2, I get theta 2, I then should be able to get theta 3. Once I have theta 3, then I can get theta 4, and I can figure out the path of the light through the prism. Okay, now another thing that's uh, talked about with the prism is called the deviation. The idea that the light was originally coming in this direction and it's going to end up going out in this direction. It undergoes, notice this dotted line indicates the direction it was originally traveling and it's going to refract off and go off in this direction. This angle is called the total deviation of that light. Now to see that, I, I like uh, thinking in terms of individual deviations. Originally the light was coming in, going along the dotted line, and uh, the idea that it's going to deviate a little bit from its direction, it, it didn't go that way, it bent a little bit and going this way. I'm just going to call it D1, that's that deviation angle. And if you can see this, you can see that theta 1 on this side is the same as theta 1 that way, and the deviation is just theta 1 minus theta 2. Off here, we now have the light traveling 
uh, in this direction after that first deviation it was going off like this uh, instead it refracted at this next surface it underwent another deviation deviation 2 uh, that's going to be theta 4 uh, theta 3 is here so this angle is theta 3 and I can come up with uh, the second deviation is theta 4 minus theta 3 put it together the total deviation is our two separate deviations theta 1 minus theta 2 and theta 4 minus theta 3 the second deviation and the total what we can do is pull theta 1 and theta 4 together I have a minus theta 2 plus theta 3 but I already know that uh, theta 2 plus theta 3 is the apex angle so the overall deviation is going to be theta 1 plus theta 4 minus the uh, not deviation angle excuse me the apex angle uh, typically like that's maybe 60 degrees but it could be any any kind of an angle so this is kind of a quick trip through uh, a prism you want to kind of think through it uh, sometimes he gives the problems where they're not quite so uh, obvious that, that this is a prism problem uh, let's say he gives you a problem like this this was a test question um, I, I don't have the actual one Xerox here but or mimeographed but I've got uh, this this one it was a piece of glass this is 60 degrees this is 60 degrees it's it's flat uh, it's got an overall length of eight centimeters and he's bringing in a ray of light or a laser beam is going to be one centimeter up uh, and it's going to re he wants to know where does it exit this piece of glass now coming in like this it's not surprising to find that it's going to refract and refract down and when it gets to here it's a possibility that it could go on through uh, I think you maybe are starting to see already it's not going to happen uh, this is coming in at an angle that's greater than the critical angle but we need to show that and uh, it's going to reflect off and then it's going to refract through again and he wants to know it what where does the ray exit you know and how high is that ray coming in at one centimeter it goes off at what what distance so this is kind of a good one to kind of get your head around as far as playing with the basic geometry uh, people get rusty with that and I know some people even ha haven't had any geometry and it gets pretty tough for them um, so the first thing we deal with is this first refraction uh, uh, this is n1 out here uh, the air sine of 30 degrees oh let me just be clear that this this is 60 degrees here and so with respect to the horizontal hopefully you can see that that would be 30 half of 60 and so sine of 30 degrees is equal to the glass 1.5 times the sine of theta 2 you would get that that's measured relative to the normal uh, you can do a quick calculator and come up with that theta 2 is almost 20 degrees coming off at 20 degrees we need to figure out what theta 3 is again so we got to get that angle now uh, seeing these things can be a little difficult if we look at this normal which is vertical and this uh, vertical line we should be able to take these two and realize that this is theta 3 this angle here too should be theta 3 okay with parallel lines and this line was already 60 so from that I can come up with theta 3 <coughs> this angle has got to be 60 plus theta 2 or about 79 and a half degrees okay so I mean these things uh, you want to kind of work through yourself to convince yourself of that we need to determine where this thing is going to hit though uh, so that we can start to play with this uh, here <coughs> I've got this broken up into L1 some length here there's gonna be another uh, distance here L2 there's gonna be another distance L3 and then there's gonna be a little distance extra distance L4 and so wow a lot of stuff to keep track of these typically get to be kind of a nasty little problems but we can get L1 that's easy enough this is just the tangent of 60 it's got to be this 1 over L1 or solving for L1 uh, 
L2 is uh, going to be, since we know uh, this, uh, this angle, theta 3, we can say the tangent of that is L2 uh, over the uh, side adjacent is, is going to be one, 1 centimeter, so I can get uh, L2, so I get that distance. And uh, then uh, the rest of this should be the same as the total was 8 minus this and come up with with what uh, L3 and L4 are. I'm not going to, I could get them individually, but I actually don't have to do that. Um, this is a case where there's uh, lots of ways, of course, of doing the geometry, so you might do it differently. But I've got these kind of shaded blue triangles. You'll notice that both sides were at 60, so those angles are equal. Um, also, this angle here and this angle, because theta 3s are equal, these two angles have to be equal. So that means that all the angles are equal. These blue triangles are going to be similar triangles. And so I ought to be able to do them as a relative kind of proportion. I can say this one, uh, one centimeter is to L1 plus L2, so I've got that is equal to the height of uh, this is going to be over its, its length, L3 and L4. And that was L3 and L4, I've got this. I realize I'm whipping through this pretty fast, but hopefully you can kind of follow kind of the general strategy of this and then go back and look through this in detail. Uh, so I can go ahead and solve for H. So it's about a third of a centimeter that it emerges. These type of problems are typical of what he will do uh, on the exam, so don't be surprised if you see one. He likes this idea that when they go through the medium, they may be hit here at, at maybe at the critical angle, maybe not at the critical angle. Uh, a real quick test here to see if the, instead of going off this way, it actually refracted through. We need to kind of test it. And that was going from the glass, or 1.5 times the sine of that angle, 79 and a half degrees, is equal to the sine of theta 4. So this is, again, just using Snell's law. Uh, but uh, looking at this for sine of Snell's law, sine of theta 4 has to be equal to 1.47. Can that be? Well, if, if you're on your calculator, calculator is going to give you an error message. Uh, the sine can't be greater than 1. So the, your reaction should be, oh well, if it can't happen, uh, all we have to have a case of total internal reflection. So again, we need to consider this, but this is a case of total internal reflection. Okay, I'd encourage you kind of on your own to kind of go through this, and I realize they get kind of messy, and some of these are, are kind of difficult. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, the information was uh, that this is a, this piece of glass. These are both 60 degrees. Uh, this bottom edge is 8 centimeters. The light beam is coming in parallel to the base at 1 centimeter up. Okay, And then uh, ultimately, because these angles are equal, it's going to go off at the same. So that's the easy part of it, <laughs> uh, finding the direction of that, but then to get the height that it's going to get bumped up. So, okay. Don't want to scare you, but uh, there's some of them that are out there like that. Okay, let's, let's uh, use refraction and start to uh, look at basic things like, uh, like uh, focal points of, of lenses. Uh, let's start with a, what's called a converging lens. Uh, it it kind of looks like this. We'll get more into why the why behind this but we can do something very similar to that we did with the mirrors where we send in parallel light and it's going to come to a sharp focus hopefully or reasonably sharp if we use small angles uh, and uh, that is going to be the focal point this is going to be the focal length and that's going to be true uh, these go in either direction so I, I will typically with a lens will mark a focal length here and we also mark one on the other side the one for the other side is that I could have light instead of coming into my focal point could be going out of my focal point and going off and will go out parallel 
So consider these two, all we're doing is changing the direction of the light. We can send it either direction. So the basic principle is called reciprocity. Uh, and it can be very helpful if we're kind of figuring out what's go going on. Uh, a diverging lens is one that's concave. And uh, here the light coming in is going to come in and it's going to end up diverging and going out. We can extrapolate the rays back to what we'll call the focal point here. We still do that. And the focal length is this. We're, we're going to call this going to be, is going to be a negative number. Uh, this focal point is kind of like a virtual focal point of this thing. Uh, these rays appear for when you're over here as though they are coming from this point. Um, we can, uh, let's see, we can also uh, do the focal point on this side where rays are headed this way and then they would end up coming out parallel. So one bringing parallel rays in and they're diverging or the other one when they're converging and going out parallel. So this uh, hopefully will help kind of with your intuitive notions of what these elements look like. Okay, uh, Similar to the, uh, the mirror, where uh, we used a concave mirror to form a real image, uh, we need a, a convex lens to form a real image with a lens. So there's a little bit of a difference between this and the mirror, although there's a lot of similarities. We're going to end up using the same basic equation to describe the object, image, and focal length of the lens. Um, but we're going to start off with the object and we are going to have the light traveling this direction and uh, so we'll call this the front side of the of the lens and the other side the back side of the lens um, and if we place place this object here with this uh, this point light is coming off of it in all directions the principal uh, construction rays we're going to be playing with is one that's coming in parallel. We know that parallel rays have to pass through the focal point. So we've got that. Um, also, a ray coming through this focal point has to come in and go out parallel. Uh, a useful one that is very good for kind of seeing what's going on is this ray that passes through the center of this. Uh, we're going to consider that, the, that for this, what will be what we'll call thin lens and small angles, that these two surfaces are virtually parallel and vertical, that the light passing through should just pretty much just go straight on through. Uh, there would be a little bit of a displacement, but it would still be in this direction. That is, uh, but since we're all the problems we're going to be dealing with, we're going to call it thin lenses, uh, these are going to be thin, arbitrarily smooth. Uh, that's why I use this dotted line for construction reasons, that it sits at that point. That is uh, where the lens is to be. Okay, um, and so I have an object over here. I have this image. Uh, we measure the P uh, from from uh, the, the uh, lens out to the object. We measure the Q, the image distance, from the lens out to the image. Uh, and this basic picture is where everything is positive. So it's in terms of sign conventions, I kind of pick, pick this other than the, the image will be inverted. In fact, real images will always be inverted. Uh, virtual images will not be. So this is kind of, kind of a quick test. Uh, as long as you've got your object here, P is positive, and you want to solve for Q, we can use this equation to do it. Uh, here I would have a positive uh, P. It's possible though when I'm solving this I get a negative Q. Now the positive Q is where the image is on this side, so this is a positive Q. If I get a negative Q, that just means the image is on the other side of the, of the lens. Um, if uh, we get to a beast that's called the uh, virtual object, uh, that's where the object could be on this side. And then this, this just becomes a negative number. So 
uh, again, everything here is, is positive with the exception of the magnification and the image. Uh, and it's, I, I think, a good way to just kind of sort of burn this in your memory. Everything here is positive. Anytime any one of these elements flips to the other side, it goes in as a negative. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, now as far as magnification, again, magnification is what is the ratio of the height of the image compared to the height of the object. So that's uh, sort of intuitive. Uh, we can look at these shaded green triangles again. These two angles are going to be the same. They're right triangles. These triangles should be similar so that H is to P as H prime is to Q. We can just do those, that simple ratio of Q to P. Uh, we do, to make our sinus work out, we insert this negative because it will be an inverted, uh, uh, inverted image. We would consider H prime would already be negative, and, but we have to doctor that negative sign for the magnification. Okay, um, now if we, uh, we can get a virtual image, and that happens when actually when we get inside the focal length, if we've got our object here, it's got this height. Uh, we look at, a uh, quick look at the rays, principal rays here, we get a parallel ray, it would pass through the focal point. Um, the one that would pass through the center of the lens would go straight on through. So now I've got a couple of these that are actually coming off. They're diverging. They're not converging. They appear to be coming from this point back here. And so if I have in front of this, this is the basic idea of a magnifying glass. If you have something in front of it, and I'm going to look through it. I'm going to look through it, and these rays that are, are diverging, uh, my lens in my eye can converge to the back of my retina, and I can see it. And I will see a virtual image back here. It's going to be enlarged uh, a great deal, and so this would be a, a, mag, uh, a magnifier, the basic idea of the magnifier. Um, in this case, uh, we still want to use the same basic expression for, uh, for the lens and mirror. Um, everything here is positive with one exception. Q on this side would go in as a negative. And if you do that, uh, all of these are going to work out. The negative Q will get rid of this other negative. It will give you a positive magnification. This is going to be right side up and enlarged. And uh, Let's see, anything else to say? Okay, so this would be a, a case of, for a convex lens, of a virtual image. Okay, uh, we can do a uh, diverging lens, concave lens. That's where the light tends to spread out. This will never by itself form a, a real image. Uh, the idea that if you have some object, the rays coming through it, this parallel ray that's going to come in is going to appear to diverge from the focal point on this side. And uh, there will be one that will go straight on through the center of this lens. So, this one off to the center. And actually these two are enough to tell the story uh, where, uh, excuse me, this one <laughs> coming through uh, is going to be the height of this thing. This one coming off, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection is going to go off. I, I'm having trouble seeing this myself. Um, yeah, anyway, these, these extrapolated rays, probably this one and this one are, are enough to tell what's happening, where the image is. We only really need to be able to calculate it. What's going to happen here is we've got uh, P is going to be positive. Uh, we're going to end up with both uh, the focal length will be negative for a diverging and Q will be negative because it's going to be back on this side. So again, I use the same basic idea that P is positive it's over here, Q is positive is here, but it's going to be negative so it's going to be back here. And uh, anyway, this you can take a look at those and hopefully this makes sense to you. Right, uh, you, that, that's right. Uh, the, the, the diagrams aren't terribly different as we come in closer. 
I, I kind of running on time. Uh, I, I didn't draw a lot of these because the basic picture is going to look the same. As you change where the, the object is, your image is going to change its distance and size. But the base, it's always going to be on this side of the equation. Yeah. Oh, uh, right. We'd, we'd be looking at this parallel ray. Um, well, it is this. Uh, for, for a diverging lens, the focal point is considered back here. It's this virtual ray. It is true that this parallel ray coming in here is going to go off and diverge this way. And we, this focal point, we never have really rays going through that per se. Uh, these particular rays, this one, is again, I've got a dotted line to indicate this is an extrapolated ray. So if your eyeball's over here, it looks like it's all coming from, uh, f uh, or this one looks like it's coming from that point. These other ones are coming from this point, and so your eyeball up here is going to see this here. Oh, um, oh, okay, I could have done that. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there is another ray, and I didn't put it on here, that is going to go from here through this focal point. And as it comes down and goes through here and gets over to here, it is now going, it will go off. No, I haven't got that wrong. There's another focal point over here that I didn't, oh, that's this one. And this one headed this way is, is headed this way but ends up going off parallel. So if you're thinking of that symmetry of a parallel ray will uh, diverge from this focal point. Another one that is... Uh, How would it do that? How would it well, okay, this... Uh, Okay, this is partly uh, how we define this. Let me back up here. Uh, oh, wait a second. Uh, yeah, for a diverging lens, this focal point is, these rays don't necessarily go through it. I just have one that happens to go through it. These are dotted lines uh, to this focal point, indicating that these rays are going to be diverging and they appear to diverge from that point. So this focal point on this side, we can deal with the focal point on the other side as long as these rays that are converging here, they end up, if they're headed this way, they're going to end up going out parallel. This one uh, is a hard one to see because we are really kind of dealing with virtual rays there. Um, that's certainly that's true for this, which we got. Yeah, I think we've got that here. I've got it going through both of them, where we get one coming straight through, and it's going to go off parallel. I think this is what you're thinking, and uh, this is for a converging lens. And then this one where we had. Oh, I didn't put that in. Um, Uh, let's see, I don't have all the rays on here. Um, oh yeah, I do. Uh, this one coming in parallel will pass through this focal point. This one that passes through the focal point will go out parallel. So convert, but, but this is clumsier when we deal with the idea of this diverging lens. Uh, Usually, just one is about all you really need. You can make it work, but it's usually kind of a clumsy workaround. Uh, usually, it's just this first one that is probably the most revealing as far as what's going to go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now um, we can start to deal with systems of these. And probably this first one would be the idea that I'll just take a simple lens here and form a real image of it. H and, and this is going to be H prime. 
And so there'll be a natural magnification of this one, which should just be H prime over H, and uh, form that. Now, these rays that are coming here, we've just got two of these construction rays, but there's going to be a whole family of them that are going to pass through that point. Uh, and now, since they're headed off, they are, this is acting like an object. And so we're going to say that this image from the first lens is now the object for the second lens. As we uh, do that, we can play again here and get this object and then now this image, which will be our final image, we can talk about the magnification of this lens and that's going to be H double prime over H. Now, something that works out nicely with magnifications. If I've got the first magnification from the first lens and take it times the magnification of the second lens, think about what that is. Uh, magnification of one is H prime over H, and the magnification of this other one is going to be H double prime over H prime. The H's, H primes drop out, and we're left with just H double prime over H. Which, if you think about it, that makes the sense that it should be termed the total magnification of this thing. Uh, that this is the final image height versus the original object height, and uh, that would be the total magnification. Now, usually for calculations, we would rather uh, do it in terms of P and Q. Um, so the idea of that, this magnification 1 is, is uh, going to be in this form, a minus Q over P. And then same way with this one would be a, a minus Q over P would be its magnification. Magnification 1 times the magnification of the other is the total magnification. Okay. Okay. How are we? Okay. Um, how about if we have a spherical surface? It's a more general case. Um, this indicates we've got some surface. I've got two indices of refraction. Uh, I could have a medium over here, or maybe it's just air, and maybe this is glass or water. Uh, this surface that this light is going to strike is going to be a curved surface that has some radius of curvature and a center to that curvature. Uh, if I place an object, let's say, out here, and here for this first part, it will look at the, the actual rays that are coming from the bottom of the object. Uh, those rays are going to come up, a whole bunch of them, but this is one of them that's going to come up and is going to hit uh, this surface and it's going to refract. From the center of curvature that would define the normal line and then we would say that the incident angle uh, and the refracted angle coming off here would obey uh, Snell's law. Uh, one thing we will be dealing with, these are going to be small angles so this original Snell's law is going to be reduced to just, uh, we'll just use the angles themselves instead of the sign. And I don't want to get into too many details here. This, uh, this, this angle they call alpha. This angle the book calls beta. This angle they call uh, uh, lambda. And uh, these are small angles as well. So they all, sh these triangles all share the same height here. And we can talk about the tangent of these angles, the tangent of alpha, tangent of beta, tangent of gamma, and put them in terms of these ratios. And then we can just start to pull this together instead of uh, theta 1. Theta 1 is made up of these two angles, alpha and beta. Theta 2 is actually going to be beta minus gamma is going to be what's theta 2. and uh, the result of that, do some math, cancel your H's, rearrange things, is going to be a little bit different looking beast here for our calculations. Instead of 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F, we're going to have N1 over P plus N2 over Q, and then we're going to have an N2 minus N1 over R is going to be uh, uh, effectively the 1 over F 
relationship that we're going to have, the focal, focal length of this thing. Uh, this picture here that I have here, everything here is positive. Uh, so this is with the assumption that light is traveling in this direction. Uh, is going to hit this front side, is going to be the front surface. This is going to be the back side. Uh, we are going to assume that all of this is taking place within the material itself, so it could be as big as you want this way, but all of this is contained inside this. It could be glass or water or some imaginary uh, material here. Um, Something that isn't obvious here, and we need it in a problem here that we're going to do shortly, is the idea of magnification here. Now the idea, I, I found the point at which, where the image would be using this ray coming from the bottom, and it gives us the, excuse me, the bottom of the image here. Uh, and I want to find the height of that image compared to the height of the object. Now, we can look at this as a simple uh, triangle here uh, in that uh, we've got, we're going to have this angle here, I'll call it theta incident, and there's going to be a theta refracted, the refracted angle. Uh, there's going to be a, a, this basic refraction taking place right at this point here. I think it's the simplest way to look at this. And we'll use the uh, Snell's Law, so I could have an N1 on this side, an N2 on this side, sine of theta 2. For small angles, we've got theta uh, incident and theta r. Uh, we can get the, the angles, because they're small angles, the, uh, the angle is uh, very similar to the sine and is almost equal to the tangent. We can set all of these things equal for small angles and tangents. Uh, here I've got theta initial. The tangent of that is going to be h over p. The tangent of theta refracted is going to be h prime over q. And so I end up replacing these with h over p, h prime over q. Um, there is a, uh, there is going to be a negative because it's inverted. And now I can just rearrange this. The magnification, which I mean to be h prime, bring h here, that's going to be the magnification, will be equal to uh, n1q, to over uh, N2P, we've got a negative sign indicating that it's inverted. And so again, just summing this up, this is the magnification for a, a surface like this. Uh, where in the past we've looked at with both mirrors and lenses as magnification as being Q over P or minus Q over P. We've got these indices of refraction that we really need to include for magnification. Okay, wow, a lot of stuff. What he might ask you. Uh, we're going to uh, take and use this idea. That's this relationship here. We're going to do it twice to come up with a lens maker's equation. Because we're going to need this because uh, you've got some uh, homework problems as well as he has done this on the exam where he gives you the dimensions of the, of the lens and he expects that you will just calculate what its uh, focal length should be. So what we do uh, is we use, the, let's say we've got air out here or a vacuum, we've got some glass. Uh, for this case, uh, this R, let me back up one slide again. One is set. Again, uh, in terms of signs here, everything here is positive. P is positive if it's on the front side. Q is positive if it's on the back side. That's just like with lenses. And the radius of curvature, that center, if it's on the back side, this R goes in this equation as a positive number. If the center of curvature is back on this side, it goes in as a negative number. Okay, and we're going to need that for this problem that's coming up. Okay, so these are kind of the pieces that are in place. We can make use of this where we're really going from one surface, surface one, through this other surface.
And we start with the idea that surface one maybe has all this material back here, and then we're going to carve out uh, the second surface. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm choosing this one mainly for sign convenience where R2 and R1 are both going to be positive. They're going to be positive because the centers of curvatures are on the back side, not on the front side. We'll look at some other examples here in a moment. So I'm going to make use of this expression. I'm going to do it two times. For the first surface that the light hits, I'm going to 1 over P plus I'm going to have the 1 is because the index of refraction out here is 1. I'm just doing it for air. Uh, N2, the index is now for that of maybe glass or something if we're making a lens. I'll just call it N. And then N2 minus N1, that's going to be N minus 1, all over the radius R1. And so that would describe the image-object relationship. Now, because this is a thin lens, the first image from this first surface is going to be back here. And that is going to be on the back side of this second surface. So what we'll do for the second surface uh, I take uh, N1, now I'm going now from the glass, so that's going to be N, all over the P. Now the, 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 the um, object distance for that first, sur uh, excuse me, for the second surface is going, uh, for the first surface I get an image at Q1. That same image is now going to become a virtual object for the second surface. So I put in Q1, that distance is the same. It was positive up here, but down here I put it in as a negative because it is going as in as a virtual object. So this enters a minus sign there. That's a tricky feature. And then uh, 1 over the final uh, image for the total lens. So, I've, and I've got that would be N2, which would be 1 minus N1, which is N, all over R2. Now, we can make the lens equation by saying, I'm going to just take these two and add these two expressions together. I'm going to have a 1 over P. These two terms are going to cancel since this one was positive and this one being a virtual object is negative. They're going to cancel. And that just leaves me with 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to uh, take this uh, plus this. Uh, we can do a little algebra here, not doesn't take much here, and we can come up with this expression which is called the thin lens equation. Or, uh, or I, I should say, this is this is the image object and, and along with this, this should be 1 over f, all of this, since we're making a lens. And that 1 over f should be equal to n minus 1 all over, well, you can read here, 1 over r1. That goes in first, and then minus 1 over r2. Now, I developed this where everything was positive, almost everything, except for virtual objects here. Um, uh, for this case, where the two centers are on this side, and you get a surface that looks uh, like this. It's still converging. If we want to look at a more extreme case, this would be a case of real convergence where we have two surfaces here. This R1, this would go in as a positive since its center of curvature is here. So, so R1 would go in this expression positive. Um, if the second surface has its center of curvature back here, that R then would go in as a negative number. So if I put in a negative number here, the negative and negative will cancel one another and I end up with a larger overall number and a larger focal, a, a larger convergence to this thing. It's one over the focal length. And uh, so it makes it a stronger lens. Uh, if I have two surfaces that are concave, I would expect a negative. Here, the center of curvature is back on this side for the first surface, R1. It's positive for R2. So when you get back here, R1 was negative. R2 is positive, but I got a negative here. I end up with an overall negativeness here, which means that it's for a 
uh, uh, diverging lens and it's going to be very divergent because, because of the shape here, the way I've chosen my centers of curvature. Okay, so hopefully this uh, uh, makes some sense. This is good for both uh, diverging as well as converging lenses, so it works for any of those, but you do have to watch where the center of curvature is. Okay. Okay, let's, let's put it all together. This is an exam question. I picked it out because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fairly uh, like what he'll do. Um, we have a small frog that's placed in a 2.5 centimeter glass sphere, diameter of 10 centimeters or radius of 5. Uh, convex lens is then placed a distance D in front of the surface of the sphere. If the lens has a focal length of six centimeters, he says, what is the value of D, and that is where do we place this, in order to, to have an image that is upright and magnified by seven? Okay, so that, that is, would be its total magnification. Okay, so let's, let's play with this. First, we've got this object is inside this glass sphere. So it's back to this uh, case. We need to make use of this relationship here. N1P uh, plus N2. Well, anyway, you can read that. That's what we just developed. Um, the N1 is going to be the glass. So the light is, is coming from the frog. A lot of people get kind of confused what's going on. Probably the light from the room is going in into the glass sphere. It's lighting up the frog and the light is reflecting off the frog and that's what we're looking at. This light is going to go out this way and uh, is going to, so, so this surface is the front surface and this surface is the back surface with light going left to right. So in using this, I'm going to have N1, I'm going to be back uh, in the glass, 1.5 will be the index of refraction. Uh, over P, which is back here, 2.5 centimeters, plus uh, 1 over Q is equal to N2 minus N1, which would be N2 is out here, that's just 1 minus 1.5. The radius of curvature, this is a kind of tricky. Uh, this sphere was 10 centimeters in diameter, a radius of 5. This goes in this equation, that radius is, goes in as a minus 5 because the center of curvature is on the front side of, the, of this surface. Okay, tricky. Okay. Uh, from this, we can just, a uh, little algebra, you can do that. Q is equal to a minus 2 centimeters. This minus indicates that it's on the, on, on back on this side or the front side of the glass. So there's going to be an image here at a minus 2 centimeters, minus 2 in. So this frog is going to appear to us, if we're looking at it from the outside, as though it's sitting over here at 2 centimeters, 2 centimeters from the front part of the glass. Um, okay, uh, then uh, um, uh, we can look at what is the magnification of that. Uh, that is going to be, we're going to have, uh, uh, and that will be our first magnification, I'll just title it M1. Uh, this is this stuff with the ratios of not only P to Q, but also along with the ratios of the indices of refraction. So uh, I can come in with N1 is uh, 1.5, that's the glass, N2 is 1. Uh, we've got uh, P and Q. P was 2.5 centimeters back, that's the object. The image, uh, negative 2. We can do that and we end up with a magnification. It's positive, so the frog looks upright, um, as, as 1.2, so it's a little bigger than the actual frog itself. And so if you're a kid looking at one of these glass balls, you look at that, it looks like uh, the uh, uh, frog is a little bigger. Okay, so then we want to say, now this, we want to play with the lens. Now, keep in mind that this uh, image of the frog back here now becomes the object to the lens. The lens is here, the light is traveling this direction. This is on the front side, so this distance from the lens to the image here is going to be our P. 
And so for the lens, we have to have this di overall distance d, which we don't know, know yet, but we need to add to it this extra two centimeters to come up with the object distance. Uh, we also have this idea that the total magnification of seven should be equal to the product of the magnifications. Well, I've already come up with this first one, 1.2, times the second magnification that it would have with this lens and that overall should be uh, seven. It should have magnification seven times the original height of the frog. Um, uh, so just from this I can quickly solve for M2, has to, to obey this, 5.8 and I've got that magnification. I can also come up with the magnification uh, for the lens, I don't have any of these indices of refraction, it's just minus Q over P. Uh, the minus Q, the P distance again is D plus 2, uh, but it ha that has to equal the magnification of 5.8. And so now we are able with the lens equation to go one final step. Uh, we can say 1 over the object distance, object distance again is D plus 2, plus 1 over the image distance. Now the uh, image distance is oh uh, yeah um, I've got okay I'm kind of messing up here. I've got, I've got uh, the Q. If I solve for Q I should have put it as a separate line here. Uh, or let's see minus Q is equal to 5.83 times D plus 2. And so I've got again I've got that minus sign for that uh, that it's negative. I got the magnification times D plus 2. And uh, so that that is the object, that is the image, uh, it's over the 1 over F for the focal length. The focal length was uh, given in the problem of 6 centimeters, so I put in that as 6. And then just some math, it's not difficult to get D is 2.957 centimeters. So this is, a, this is one where he kind of wrapped it all up into one, one problem uh, using a spherical surface playing with the magnification for a spherical surface, so probably this is the most abstract stuff, and then using the thin lens equation along with the idea of products of magnifications being the total magnification is also involved. Whew. Okay, these uh, can get tricky and I, I, I can share your frustration <laughs> if you're uh, trying to do these. Uh, typically, you'll, you'll, you will get, I'm sure you'll get some problems like this or something like this. Um, okay, probably now is a good time to take a break because uh, <laughs> with the optics, this stuff with geometrical optics is, is a pain. Maybe it's good we kind of got that out of the way. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast or too slow or okay anyway hopefully it's all just kind of ringing bells uh, then the next part of optics is really where we get into the wave nature of light this is called physical optics uh, and uh, that uh, luckily is a little more intuitive hopefully hopefully or will build your intuition with it a little more so let's take a break of uh, about 15 minutes and then we'll try it again. Yeah, just one second. I want to just want to shut off this camera. Oh, my bad.